Cool. Well, we can't we can't talk about the Celtics anymore on the podcast because now they are <laughs> definitely out of the playoffs. <laughs> Man, I love the Celtics, but the 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 few games I watched were I, I no, it was fun. It was fun up until the last yeah. game. Yeah. yeah, my buddy who's a huge Heat fan said he had lost all hope and he was just like already starting his depression drinking because you know the Heat were going to be the first team to lose the the sweep or whatever, and. Um, well, that didn't happen, so. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Uh, well, today we thought we'd talk about kind of what's going on uh, with React and continue our theme of talking about some of the new stuff coming with server components, server actions, suspense, all that good stuff. Vercel's been putting out a bunch of videos from, uh, I guess, what was it from? I think like just all the work they've been doing recently. I don't think there was a specific uh, event. Maybe they were like launch week. Was yeah, their ship week. Event there. Th that's right. And they had a bunch of t folks from the team there. And um, in particular, this interview that we'll link in the show notes with Sebastian and uh, Andrew on the React team talking about, basically, I thought it was a good look back at the last three to five years in kind of React's development about why we are where we are today, you know? And so we thought we'd talk about that and then talk about uh, React server components coming to Remix and Redwood because both those frameworks kind of announced, I guess, their intention on Twitter to, to add uh, React server components there. So we could talk about kind of what that means. So I'm not all the way through this talk, but um, it's pretty cool and... Uh, just thought it, it kind of provoked some questions I had. So basically the talk is about, uh, you know, suspense being the first kind of linchpin in the whole architecture. Uh, I like the story that uh, Andrew painted kind of halfway through where he talks about, you know, if you go back to a world where everyone's writing SPAs with React doing data fetching on the client, because React always needs a frame to render, then every time you load data, you need a loading state. Anytime you fetch data with a hook in a client, you do something like use query, you get back is loading, and then you get back the data. And the first frame that renders, either when you first render the component or if the component is, is pre-rendered on the server with SSR, the is loading is gonna be true and the data is not gonna be there. And so that led to this situation where Every time you load data, you add a spinner and then you get like the spin again and you get spinners everywhere because a developer might just be thinking about loading new data for this part of the page. They have to add a loading state. And so that's a bummer because it's nice that the, that the app is always responsive, right? It's always important, I think, to keep in mind like why it is that way. It's not, it's not just that it was that way because it was just a pure concession and that's the only way to do it. The reason people started writing apps like this in particular with client side navigation and fetching is because of the way a lot of native apps work, which is you tap something and you get an instant response with a spinner and then you get the repaint once the data comes in. So in a lot of ways that's, that's superior because the app is always responsive and you can't do that kind of thing. If your server blocks on a response to a link navigation or, or a button click. So the problem, so that's the benefit. The problem was that, Spinners were defined everywhere locally where the data fetching was. And that led to suspense. Sebastian said that that's what kind of the, the outgrowth of that problem was the idea that you should be able to specify data loading co-located with the component that needs it. That's kind of adhering to this theme of like encapsulation and components and composition. But to make every component responsible for the loading state is the problem. And so suspense came out of that, where you can say the parent can be more intentional about what it renders if there's a component that's not ready yet. That led to suspense. And then from suspense, you had um, suspense for data fetching, right? So suspense came first, and it didn't really work necessarily for data fetching because of this whole cat issue with like there need to be a first class cache that you can like read and write write to re read from but suspense worked for other things and in general like the mechanism of the promise was integrated and then there was this part where it's like well this was really came from this original problem of data fetching 
And so suspense for data fetching is kind of like the next big piece. And we had worked with libraries like SWR that were client side data fetching that had like suspense options and that delegated their loading state to like a parent suspense boundary. But there was a lot of work in the last couple of years about what would like the official React solution look like. Not just something that throws a promise, but something that React has more power to coordinate over maybe like a shared cache or something like that. And they put out some experiments with that, but ultimately that's where server components entered in. Because the way Andrew put it is like server component, React server components are suspense for data fetching. It's kind of like that, that was the logical conclusion based on the other set of problems that doing data fetching on the client uh, created. And so once they realized that you can move parts of that problem to the server, but still do it in a way that composes with the React component model, that's really all you need for this kind of missing piece of like, what is the React way to fetch data? Their answer is a React server component. And that is also re suspense for data fetching. So that's that, what you just said is an awesome story. And uh, it's funny because me as a developer, there's two, two very big benefits I get from that. One is the thing you mentioned with suspense and the coordinating of loading. So anything can just suspend and you can delegate the loading up to the parent. Uh, and, but two, like data fetching is so much easier on the server. It's just so much easier. So the fact that like, these are both the things that fall out of it, it's like, you know, you just get two things, two awesome things. So it's, right. that's a really exciting story. Totally. And then there's other things too, that come from this that are like, it's not just about designing thoughtfully loaded, designing thoughtful, like designing thoughtful loading screens. Um, it's that if your data fetching is not just in a library that throws a promise, but is actually like this async react server component that is kind of aware of more parts of the whole puzzle, react could add things like, well, maybe we don't show the loading spinner if it's a fast connection, you know, or we show it after some period of time or whatever. So that's even more part of this that, that can come about. But I really like that focus because the, these are all like implementation details. You could think about it. Suspense mm -hmm. is really like in not an implementation detail, but because you can add boundaries and you have to know like where the thing is being thrown. But it's I mean, for us, it, it, yeah. no, for us, it kind of is because as app developers, the, the underlying frameworks we're using are going to implement suspense, but we are just going to create a, a loading dot JS, JSX, TSX. That thing is going to use suspense, but we don't really care, right? Exactly. Like, and that's the point too. So that's pretty cool. So I like that focus, that angle on the whole thing, which is like, I'm adding a new page that needs data. I just worry about specifying the query that's needed for that page, the data requirements for that page or that route or that component that shows when a toggle flipped or whatever. And the framework and the architecture can take care of the rest and it can still be like core. It doesn't add a pop of a loading spinner. It doesn't flash the screen, blah, blah, blah. So I like that that was like the focus, you know? Also, uh, just the server rendering aspect is yes. awesome because we, since you couldn't fetch data, you only had an initial frame to server render. We ended up creating things like, um, what was it, get server side props to fetch before render. So when render happened, it had all the data. This just seems, yeah, I, I, this just seems cleaner. Component can fetch, await the fetch, and then render. Definitely, definitely. That just reminded me of a, of a tweet that uh, Dan had this week or last week, which was talking about container components and presentational components. And it also got to this point about why React server components is the answer, React's answer to suspense for data fetching or how do you fetch data with React as opposed to something like a loader function or get server side props. Um, and, and, and ultimately the answer is like composition, this idea that you can, components are more composable than functions that don't return like JSX elements because, um, yeah, that's just part of the model, right? So, mm -hmm. and it always feels nice if this thing is like inside the component, it just feels nice. I think the reason it feels nice is because the developer knows that there are possibilities here to compose that wouldn't be possible if I had to export some const called get server side props or whatever, like that's for this page. I can't use that anywhere else. Um, whereas if you have a component, like 
every component is invoked the same way, it can be passed as children to other components. So that was also like a big part of their talk at the beginning was just talking about like React's been out for 10 years. What's the biggest idea? What's the most important idea? It's composition. Um, so, and, and what can we compose across components depending on where they render, which environment, all that good stuff. The other, I'm just going to give like a really simple answer here, but the, the other thing is the React component has been stable for a very long time, right? If like I write a React component that has some on-click stuff in it, it's like that thing is just going to work. I don't have to, I don't get anxiety about rewriting that every few right. years. Right. As soon as you step outside the React right. component, that's all the stuff yep. that changes. That's a great point. Whether it's like the, that's a great point. the data you, you stores, can... the data fetching libraries, the loaders, the get server side props, all that stuff, that's where all the churn happens. So it feels comforting knowing that like stuff is being brought into the React component. It feels like it's um, like blessed, more stable. I don't know. I think that's a really like nice nuanced insight because um, we can render components that are class components inside of components that use hooks and we don't care because the boundary is just that angle bracket declarative invocation, you know, invoking with angle brackets and passing props. That's about all there is to it. Whereas if you had functions, you know, ultimately a component is a function, you could just write it as a bunch of function calls, but there's just more flexibility there. And, um, that's like a, a slimmed down declarative interface. So that's pretty cool. It's, it's like the, yeah, like the rule of least power, you know, we've, we've talked about that before and, um, yeah, that's pretty neat. So, um, let's see, uh, let me think for a second. So it was interesting hearing about that whole design from like the perspective of the motivation of how to fetch data. And then they talked about actions for a little bit. That's kind of where I'm at right now. But one thing I thought about here at this point, if like React server components are the answer to how to fetch data with React, kind of like we understand that's problems it solves. It solves loading spinners everywhere. It solves app developers having to think about designing loading spinners every time they fetch data. It solves having to worry about serialization and network boundary um, in like this very, uh, normally you have to think about that boundary at a very like detailed level. You have to think about it the whole way through at every point. Uh, whereas if you limit what you send back and forth to passing props, again, there's like, it's more restrictive, but react can help you out more with getting the data across the wire and limiting it to a format that's serializable. And then also, you know, you're not starting from a query that originates in the client. You can connect directly to the database, which makes that part a lot easier as well. So connecting to, to the database within a server component that composes with other React components and then passing that data to client components via props, that like solves a lot of those pain points that existed with data fetching that started on the client. Then my thought was kind of like, well, what do we give up? Because Again, there was a reason we moved there in the first place, right? There, there's a lot of benefits from doing these things in the client. Um, one of those benefits is like the way we use SWR. And I really like that library. It's a client side data fetching library. React Query works the same way. And they do things like, you know, have a cache that can like preload the data. You can warm the cache with data you know the user is going to need. And um, if you go back to a page that has a query in the cache, it renders instantly. And another thing I really like about it is that it revalidates. That's like SWR being stale while revalidate. So a lot of times in my side projects that I've used with my friends before, even little admin apps we've made for ourselves, you know, you, you haven't wired up real time anything. Like you haven't used WebSockets or anything like that. But just by clicking around the app or refocusing the browser window, you get fresh data. And so you just find that you're not refreshing those apps a lot. You're not like mm -hmm. command Ring those apps like ever, you know, um, which is like a great feeling. One way you hear the cats talked about like SPAs is like, basically does the user ever have to press refresh? And it's almost <laughs> like a goal should be that they shouldn't. That's like yeah. something that users 
have been trained to do because we're not that good at state management, real time updates, you know, revalidating old data, but users don't refresh apps unless they're like, have a bug, like a show stopping bug. Usually, usually applications on like iOS, um, you know, on their iPhone apps are up to date and there's like, they think about that. So they mm -hmm. think about providing the best user experience to get the kind of data you need in a fresh way. Whereas on the web, since refresh is kind of just part of the UI, a lot of times we just fall back on that. Oh yeah, you want to see the latest PR, just re refresh or whatever. You know, an interesting thing about this, I think to the apps that I've written over the years that use client-side data fetching, um, I mean, one of the greatest, the greatest features of it is that you know, you have, you as a developer have so much knowledge of how your app works, how your users are using your app that you can do things like when they land on the homepage, you know, they're probably, you might have like 10 links, but you know, they're probably going to go to like one of these three links. Those are the three most popular links. So you can prefetch that data, warm the cache, and then they just, it feels like instant navigation. You can do things like um, warming that cache on mouse over, warming that cache when the mouse gets within X pixels of a link. They're just, you just have so much power because you have so much knowledge of how your app works. And when you when you like get to take the time or want to take the time to nail those details, you can create a, a truly magical experience. Yeah. I think there's also kind of like the opposite end of that where I've worked on some projects where, uh, listen, we just need to ship this thing in two weeks. Like the data fetching doesn't matter. Don't, don't spend any time on that. And every link you click is like just fills the screen with loading spinners there's tons of page shift or there's, there's no feedback at all or, yes great point no feedback at all so so it's it feels like the uh there's a very wide wide uh gap between like an amazing experience and and a really bad experience and i think i think it's easy for us as developers to like see the amazing experience and just fall in love with it but then in reality uh, just because not because of like anything we have control over just in reality you might fall into just kind of the average experience uh, and I think that creates a lot of frustration I think that I think as a developer that creates a ton of frustration because you uh, know the type of app you can build and yet because of whatever reasons um, you don't have time or um, yeah you don't have space to think about it and you 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 ship something that you're embarrassed by so that's sort of like, that's my reaction to like the SWR stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's yep. like on point to this or, or what. I but. think it's very relevant. I think it's basically that what you're saying is also true about SPAs in general, which is that the baseline yes. SBA experience is worse than the baseline SS ser server side uh, app experience. It is because server side, uh, server side, rendered server-side navigation uh, applications have a better baseline because they've been around longer browsers expect it so browsers can ex provide feedback back and forward works the browser cache works it's all based on that uh http responses so the baseline ssr experience is better than the baseline csr experience but the csr potential is higher than the ssr yes. potential so i think that's a really good um, that's a really good point and totally agree that in the past five or eight years or whatever, even with the frameworks and the meta frameworks, the baseline fetch data and navigate is worse. That's not, it's not good enough that you, you don't really have, we always have to think about it in the apps that we make and care about and know people are going to see. That's something we always spend more time on. And you're right that companies don't always have the resources or want to dedicate the resources to that. But if you're talking about polished UX, what happens when you click a link? How many times does the page re-render? How long does it take? Is there feedback if it takes a long time? What is that, what is that whole story when it comes to data fetching and um, navigation? The baseline's really pretty bad there. Yeah, and I think I, this might be too soon to bring up, but I think this is, this is kind of driving it. One of the reasons I'm so excited about server components is because you, you're able to quickly catch up to that baseline of the fetching data on the server. But then 
the, the steps to getting the rich client side UI that we love to build that, that has, like you said, has a higher potential. That's right there. That's like literally a component away. It's a component yes. and props away from, from that. So there you go. That's great. Great. You should be up join the marketing team. Um, <laughs> the SPA you always wanted to build is just a component away. Uh, so, okay. So let's say you have this, uh, SPA that you've dedicated, invested the time in to getting a nice UX where you have SWR, it's wired up well, you have like a global loader, so you can add a page, the loader renders in like the main window, just like navigating around Twitter does, let's say. And um, you also get the, the revalidate part so that if you open the app and you toggle off a goal, I can see it update in your little circle on my app, which is, how one of my side projects works and it's really fun and 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 the dx is awesome in that side project too so it took a while to, to wire up and the baseline's low so now you have the react team saying well server components is really the answer um to the data fetching story so let's take that app move the data fetching to the server now you don't have to think about the loading templates every time you can block on the initial request so you don't have to show a loader right there you can just check if the user's logged in, fetch their initial data. That's great, that's an improvement for sure. You don't have to design this whole architecture that you had to. And you can still add instant loading feedback via suspense boundaries. So that's great as well. So if you want that behavior where you tab from the goals to the photos and it shows instantly, you get all that, cool. So then um, I was like, well, what else are we giving up going back? Like those are the, those are the ways we improve. What about that revalidate pattern? And that's always something that's like um, out of the box, like a server driven application. How do you refresh things, right? And how do you like revalidate queries when you focus the page? And how, how could that be something that we get either as a baseline or something that's as easy to build on top of React server components as it was when we were doing fe data fetching in client side hooks? Do you have an answer? Do you have an answer? I have an, so an, this, I have an answer for this. Okay. So this is uh, where, this is where the server actions part of the conversation was going. And, um, what he was saying is that your queries happen in a react server component and let's set aside like refreshing those for a second, but usually you need to refresh something after mutation. And so actions are like this semantic bucket for mutations. It comes from actions on the form in HTML. Remix also has actions as a more fleshed out concept that do something similar. But he said, one cool thing about moving this whole thing to the server is if we have this bucket abstraction called an action that is responsible for mutations and the server knows about the queries because the server is now the answer for data fetching in React, we can really be intelligent about those two things talking to each other and we can do things like re refresh a server component after a mutation and you can also cache a lot of things this is kind of the second part which is like the benefit of something like swr gives you a client-side cache that can be fast well you move it to the server now how do you cache that how do you invalidate that because that's the hardest part of caching is how do you invalidate it? Well, if actions are like a first class concept in React, you can now cache a lot more things too because the action can invalidate the cache um, associated with it because it knows what it's mutating. That's kind of the idea anyways. And he said the benefit here is like, well, your client side data fetching library might have had caches and revalidation, but it was from the client and the client had to know. And so now by moving it to the server, what if somebody else changes something? Someone else does a mutation. Because the data fetching and the mutations are focused on happening on the server, originating from the server, right? Originating from the server, I can broadcast to other clients that there's been a mutation that's affected one of their queries, one of their data fetching components. So that was a part to me that I was like, oh, okay, I hadn't thought about that. If you have SWR, Sure, you can configure it to revalidate every five seconds or every minute and every time I focus the window. But what if I focus the, minute, minute, the window and there's just a revalidation and then you change something? I'm looking at stale data. like, mm -hmm. And that's the pattern, a stale while revalidate, but sometimes that's not good. 
Or it would be better if I could just see an update if it happened. And if the server knows both about queries and mutations, it can, it can do that for me. So I thought that was a nice way to round out that whole story. Yeah, that's, that is awesome. I, I, you know, it's interesting that SWR cache is like a distributed cache. It's not right. one cache, it's right. N caches. It's a cache right. for every single browser where the server cache can be one cache, one cache yep. that's managed. I think as you're telling that story, a question I have is the server gets a mutation and then it has to push updates out to all the various clients. That seems to me like something that is outside of React. I guess that's my initial reaction. Like that wouldn't be in React Core. I guess my question is, would that be in React Core or would that be outside of React? Is that something that is more like the next cache stuff or, or is that React? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're speaking specifically about any implementation or a particular way it would look. I think more. I think he was more focused on the, the architecture and saying that if what queries and mutations or originate from the server instead of originating from the client, now frameworks and other things can be more aggressive about caching because they have more information about when the cache should be invalidated. And that was cool. something that I hadn't like quite pieced together, but I thought that was pretty. That was a pretty cool part about it. Very cool. Very yeah. very cool. What, what was your answer going to be in terms of uh, in terms of revalidating a React server component? Well, it definitely doesn't go that far. So <laughs> it's like the training wheels example of uh, <laughs> of this. Um, I, I ran into this problem where uh, I was getting stale data, and I was navigating back to a tab. And I was looking at stale data and I, I actually was like, okay, wait, S this is never a problem in SWR because they have a on window focus, they revalidate. So, uh, that's exactly what I did. I have a hook that when you refocus the window, oh, it wow. calls, it calls router dot refresh, which is the client asking the server components to re-render. It's not, it's not the same as like window dot location dot reload, right, which is right. a full, full browser reload. Uh, it just asks, it's a client saying server components can you like give me a new i don't I'm, I'm not sure what exactly it does but it asks the server components to re-render and that repaints them on the client uh i use this i have like a an app that kicks off a bunch of server processes and that it needs to pull to see if those processes are done so i just if i know that a process is in um in flight in is running mm -hmm. i just call router dot refresh on a set timeout mm. to 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 get the latest status of it every uh, few seconds. But yeah, I needed something that when I came back and refocused. Uh, so it's pretty cool. It's like, it's actually really cool that you can do that. That is cool. Is it at a global level? Is it like in the root layout or something or just for a page segment? It's it's stuffed in a hook. So yeah, I have, um, I have like multiple components. So this is like getting too into the weeds, but I have multiple components that can kick off multiple things that happen on the server and if they all call router refresh, you just have all these refreshes happening at once and it it, it creates issues. So I have a, a context that client components can say, uh, I'm interested in knowing new server state. And if there's like three components that all want it, it makes sure that it's only requesting once every second, I think mm. is like the max time. Cool. So it's it's in that thing, that's where it lives. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, there's some issue I, I don't know if it's like a, I think it's like a dev mode issue with the latest next, but when you call router refresh, you get folk, um, in an older version that didn't happen. I just, I just upgraded to the latest version. So, uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. So it's definitely not the same. I think I'm going to downgrade to the older version to, uh, <laughs> to avoid that, but it's definitely not the same as like a seamless paint. Um, so, yeah. But ideally, it should be. I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I think so. Like, yeah, the idea. Yeah, I think so. Because yeah. it's something like the, like your it's all folk and like your fonts reflash and everything. Mm, so, mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah, ideal. I think it should be cool. But anyways, I thought that was uh, pretty cool. So we'll definitely link that in the description. And, um, you know, uh, Dan's been talking a lot about server components on, on Twitter. And one of the things he said was it's kind of bringing like set state um Reconcili reconciliation and diff and then apply the changes it's bringing that model of react across the, the server across the network to the server so this is one way to think about actions they're calling set state on the server and so if 
just in the same way that if React knows about your state and you call set state, React can take care of making sure everything's updated. Um, now React can do the same thing across the network or frameworks can do the same thing across the network. If an action has a mutation, um, they can rerun the server components and the diffing thing happens in server components as well because they just send out their output and the, the, the RSC payload comes across the wire and then React diffs it on the front end or whatever and applies the changes. It doesn't lose any of your state or anything like that. Um, so he, he made that point in a talk. He, he made the point about the whole diffing thing is really an important part of this because you could have text in an input field. You could have some data in a table coming from a server component. You hit an action. Somebody, another user does an action that mutates that data and you get a refresh, but you don't lose the text in the input field. So it's, it's like the best of both worlds, you know? The awesome thing is your refresh is just to you. It's like opaque. It's just a refresh yes. Yes. where if today, because the stuff doesn't necessarily exist right now today, if we were to do that, we would have like some web sockets wired up in effects that set new state. And it's like, yeah, you get the same result, but me, the developer, I do a lot more wiring. You do a lot more result. wiring. He, he mentioned this as well today. If you wanted to do this, you have two options, which is basically have a normalized data store, which is like what we did with Ember and Ember data, where you have a user that's ID one and they have a name and that changes and everything that's uh, rendering that user's name is reading from that normalized data store. Or you do like what we did, what we do with SWR, which is like a query cache. It's like queries and they could be denormalized. The user's name could show up in multiple places. So then you need some way, uh, be like surrogate keys usually, or a, a cache with like queries as the keys to know if they invalidate or you just revalidate all live queries. So both of those involve a lot of code and a lot of effort on the part of the developer. Yeah. But Very if you cool. can take advantage of diffing, then you can just rerun the server component tree, get the new tree, diff it, apply it. So pretty cool, pretty exciting from an architectural perspective. Um, so kind of, I guess to wrap up this, this podcast, this discussion, we, we thought it'd be fun to talk about. Okay. So that's like the work that's been going on react. It's like suspense leading to server components, leading to actions. It's kind of like a nice story. And uh, then the question is like, well, what about frameworks? And so it's part of the conversation we were just having because kind of what, what responsibilities are left up to the domain of the frameworks and the, and the meta frameworks and what of them, what, which of those responsibilities are going to stay within react. And I think this whole business about caching, deciding how to connect mutations and queries, um, how to provide that SPA like upgraded experience with more or less effort on part of on the part of the app developer versus primitives that the framework gives you that's kind of i that's how i think about the concern of the frameworks and so next 13 is the first framework to have kind of official support for react server components remix and redwood are going to be adopting them in some form and so we thought it would just be interesting to talk about our guesses at how those could look different from each other because you might listen to this story and be like, well, if react has an answer for data fetching with suspense or data fetching in react, like their answer is server components for all the reasons we talked about. And then now they're working on an actions API. Um, what's left for the frameworks to do. But I, but I think there's quite a lot left. There's quite, there's quite a bit of, um, variation and that they have to choose from in terms of how they wire all these things up. So yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing is the, the whole story about mutations you just told, like I, I want a framework that like knows where my data is stored, knows when, like literally knows like, oh, you did a mutation, you updated, uh, the post table. So anyone that's viewing these posts needs to refresh. Like I don't, I don't want to wire that up. I want the framework to do it. It'd also be cool like me controlling how the data ends up on the client. Cause like, if you think about Twitter, you don't want your feed to refresh every time mm -hmm. someone makes a new tweet because you would never be able to read a tweet. It'd just be, you know, a fire hose, but the Twitter has like a nice UI where they say like, Oh, there's 35 new tweets. Right. Um, so like a framework that like just kind of packages up 
those sort of things and I can just pick them off and uh, say, okay, I want to use like this pattern for this UI. So yeah, I guess, I guess that's a long winded way of saying, well, um, the framework is aware of like how the data is stored. It had, right. It's very, very opinionated about how the data stores. So it doesn't tell me, I mean, one of the things I loved about rails was just like, no, this is how you store data. You're not going to argue about it. And it's yep. like, yeah, it's totally fine. And it works. Yep. Uh, so something like that, I think. Yep. That's a great point. So yeah, in spite of react server components saying you fetch data with an async function and maybe let's just zoom forward to a world where server actions are stable in spite of react saying you use a server action to mutate data. That's where those things end. So when they say a server component fetches data with an async function, well, what does that async function do? Does it make a fetch call to another service? Does it read from a file system? Does it read from a socket connection to a database? React has nothing to say about those things at this point, right? And it probably never will. And similarly with the actions, uh, are the actions sending out some invalidate message to your CDN layer? Are they triggering a rebuild? Are they updating a row in a database somewhere? Um, all of those things are still unanswered. So frameworks, this is kind of where frameworks can have different opinions. And today, Next13 has a lot of documentation about fetch and they have lots of work going on around fetch caches and um, the kind of default way you do things with Next13 if you read their docs is to make a fetch request and they have a special version of fetch that takes in some additional options around how it caches those calls. And so that's like one way to do it. And then kind of on the other end, I guess that would be more opinionated. Like what you're talking about is if a framework, maybe like Redwood, um, had the same similar opinions as rails where you have models and models are represented by tables in a database and each model instance is a rook as a row and those all have primary keys and then there's foreign keys that exist between relationships and now you can imagine a framework where if i'm on post slash two and i'm seeing the comments and you're on another browser and you add a comment my app knows to invalidate the query that was used to generate that page because of surrogate keys because it knows which models and which keys were used to generate that page again, because all this is on the server. So the server has the cache for that model. It could also use a, a, a cached version, even on the initial request, because the server could know that post slash two hasn't changed since this time, because it knows again, the underlying data source that's used to generate it. So it could be cached forever until it changes. And then it can make a new version of it whenever someone edits it or changes a comment. So that's how you can imagine the framework saying, oh, user two added a comment, therefore user one, we need to refresh um, their server component over here. And that would be that would be pretty awesome because we haven't really seen anything like that out of the box. Um, and that is a problem that you have to deal with whenever you cache anything. This is, so this, and this is one, this is interesting because We've kind of gone through this story where you start off with a server rendered world. You talk about the user experience, kind of the, the not so great aspects of the UX that you want to fix with client side rendering and SPAs. Then you get there and you talk about which problems they solve, which new problems they create. Now we have a hybrid model and by moving data fetching mutation to originate the server, you solve some of those problems and what new ones do you have? And I think um, this problem of caching is a new problem that emerges from this architecture because out of the box with a Rails app that's server rendered, you don't have to think about that. If you create a new Rails app and it is a server rendered Rails app, which is what Rails apps are, a Laravel app or anything that is traditional server side technology, you don't think about that. Uh, you just click around, you make changes, but every page is a full page refresh. And so that is not, caching is just not something that developers have to think about on new apps like that. Now, if you click a page and you're looking at a copy of it in your browser and someone adds a comment, you're not gonna see an update. So you could argue that this is like 
it's not necessarily a new problem. It's because you could make every navigation like a full page refresh in one of yeah. these React Server component apps and you'd be at the same baseline. But the whole point of this architecture is that you can click around an app and not lose ephemeral client side state. And so that constraint leads to having to do client side navigation and client side navigation leads to this problem of caching. If it doesn't want to re, re, re render the entire tree every time. Yeah. But I, I just, I want to push back there a little and say kind of like that story I told where, where I refocus and I call writer dot refresh. <laughs> Why can't I do that? Like on URL change, I call router dot refresh. Yeah, I know it's not perfect, but it gets me kind of close to that. It gets me to that that baseline. So you're saying this is not Rails actually app. something that's inherent problem with the architecture. There could be a framework that fully embraces React server components for data fetching, fully embraces actions for mutations, but does basically no caching at all. And um, as you click around um, the app, you are effectively doing the same thing that you would in a Rails app, that the browser would in a Rails app. It's refreshing every page. Yeah, that's this is a great question. I think what I would like to see, just how my mind sort of approaches these problems, is I would like to start off with the baseline. Like I would like to build Twitter yeah. as a server rendered app. And so I just, if I wanna see new tweets, I have to reload the window. Yeah. Or I go to my notifications tab and I go back to my home yeah. tab and that gets the latest tweets. Yep. And then I want to start to layer in yeah. the what, what we call like the SPA feature. So maybe the first thing is every time I get a new notification, I just I see that one change to a two. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that happen how that happens, I'm not worried about, but I just want to see the framework have a way, a path for me to get there. You want the baseline uh, to be as good as a baseline Rails app. And you've never once built a Rails app side project and had to do router refresh in order to not see stale data in a confusing way. You might be looking at stale data because there's no real-time updates, but right. it's confusing um, when you click a link and then click another link and you see a version that's different than if you were to hard reload. Yes, yes, ex exactly. I think where... It's all how you started this podcast. It's all the, the potential for these SPAs is mm -hmm. so much higher. So if you can mm -hmm. start on the baseline, mm -hmm. um, but then you have the ways to just slowly, not slowly, but just like in small steps, small incremental steps, layer in those SPA experiences. Uh, and the fact that like in some time you can end up with an app like yours where someone checks mm -hmm. a box and everyone sees the animation mm -hmm. on their phone mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, yeah, that's like, I wouldn't be able to layer that in though. Right. Right. Interesting. You know, I wonder if it's, uh, if it's like, you know, Ryan Florence had this talk called like the, the curse of react. And he was talking about how react makes it so easy to do things that we wouldn't normally do in like a rails app or just a server side app. And, um, it leads you to build like a drop down that like is a really bad version of a drop down worse than the, the default one because it's easy and fun to build it with react. And so that's like the curse of react. I wonder if we were working in a framework in the way that you're the, the kind that you would, you're describing where the baseline is on every navigation, you just do a refresh and get the new tree. There's no caching basically just don't cache at all. Um, the only cache is like what's currently displayed in the browser. And, um, if like the curse of react would happen and someone would say, oh yeah, I just want to click on a to do and mutate it. So like, okay, maybe you have to use a server action to do that. And if you click on a to do and mutate it, anytime a server action happens, we also do a refresh, right? Because that's the thing mm -hmm. in rails mutations are also navigations, right? Every mutation in like a server rendered application traditionally is followed by like a redirect or some sort of navigation. And the navigation is what refreshes the page. In React, it's extremely easy to not do that, like to just call an action. And that's part of the beauty is like you have a to-do list, you're tracking off a goal. You're not thinking about refreshing the page. That's not even part of like your mental model. So I wonder if it really is intrinsic to the architecture or if it's just this kind of idea of caching, or if it's just really just the way some of the current frameworks are working. I guess if you had the constraint that every link is, is a navigation and every mutation has to use a server action, 
then you could just refresh the whole app whenever one of those two things happened. Don't cache anything. And now you have a baseline that's pretty sensible. Um, yeah. That would be interesting. I'd, I'd be interested to see that. I, I, you know, I think Remix, before even server actions or anything, I think Remix gets pretty close to this. Yep. Uh, I've always felt that way, just the, the, the Remix stuff I've touched. Um, you do a mutation, they're going to rerun all the loaders. Yep. That's a good and point. Yep. One of the one of the things here is like you have to stay in their world. Exactly. You can't you just have go. To use, yes. But me, like, I, I look at that as a plus. Like, yes. I, I need to be constrained. I agree. Or else, <laughs> or else yeah, you agree because you've seen what happens. <laughs> no, totally, I look at that as totally a plus. I totally agree. I totally do too. And DHH has talked about this with Rails before is like, we don't care about like treating people like children when, when it comes to our APIs of our framework. We're making things that we think is the right way to build the application and it's your job to learn it. And so we're not going to like restrict you and we're not going to like, give you like a subset of like Ruby that you can't hang yourself with. We're going to give you enough rope to hang yourself with, but it's your job to learn how to use the pieces. Right. So if someone's using a remix app and not using actions to do mutations, like everyone objectively can just say you're not using remix correctly. And that's, I'm totally fine with that as well. So yes, totally agree. Remix is basically this approach, no caching out of the box. Any action will revalidate all the current loaders. Now the question is, I don't think this is part of Remix today. If you do an action, this is where the server action parts come in. If you right. do an action on your browser, how does my browser know whether it needs to revalidate anything? Um, but you wouldn't get that in a Rails app either. So that's that's kind of. I still think I think I think it's a great baseline. I think it's a great. Very baseline. cool. Uh, also, just to kind of wrap this, you, you're talking about multiple different frameworks. What we'd like to see. Uh, I'm just excited for the fact that. I feel like 10 years ago or whatever. Yeah, 10 years ago, we had multiple different JavaScript frameworks and kind of the best ideas floated up to the top over the last 10 years and the idea of components. I mean, remember when these JavaScript frameworks first came out, there was no idea of components. No idea, yeah. Uh, and, but, you know, React showed that this is a great, great model. It floats up to the top and now all these frameworks have, have the idea of components, have the idea of helping developers load data, you know, just sort of all these these ideas, like the best ideas win. I I'm really happy that this this uh, this like the arena, I guess, or the competition space is now the expanding. The Thunderdome, there you go, is now expanding to the server, and so we're gonna see because we don't know, like we just don't know the answer. We think we have ideas from like our, our Rails experience, but it'll be really interesting to see. The reason I'm so excited about server components is because they're going to allow for multiple frameworks to experiment with different ideas. And I think the best ideas will just naturally rise to the top. And in 10 years from now, we will converge on the best way to load data for a rich client side app on the server and do things like the caching story you're talking about and, and all that. So yeah, I think it's really powerful that, that this is not in like a single framework and Remix and Redwood and Next all exist. So yeah, very excited. Dude, well said. It, it, it's it's we're not talking about components and, and props and uh, you know functions and stuff anymore. We're talking about server driven queries, server driven mutations. How to tie those things together with multiple users of an app. Um, you know, maybe hopefully it'll take. It won't take ten years, but maybe eventually <laughs> once we figure all this stuff out. Uh, then we can talk about the data story, right? Because everyone's talking, everyone, again, the fetch, fetch, fetch as a, as a baseline is, is too, uh, too granular. It's too, it's too, it's too low level, right? We want something a lot higher level, I think. Yes. And so it'd be nice to get there as well, but maybe that's just, um, the nature of that beast is like, there's just different requirements there. But, um, dude, really well said. I think that's, I think that's right on. I think it's awesome that. Also, it helps you to move from the frameworks between each other. If you need to work on multiple ones for whatever reason, or you use a new one, it's nice to have the vernacular of actions and queries in, in your head already and, and have a mental model for how those things tie together. And, and that React is doing more of the work uh, for those concepts. And so that you get to bring that, that's more shared knowledge you get to bring from one framework to the next. Yeah, that's great. Yes, yeah. So anyone coming from Remix to Next 12, 
wouldn't have a lot to talk about in common. They'd have to learn the different ideas. Whereas people coming from Remix to Next 13, perhaps, um, and then as eventually when Remix gets server components and maybe use the server actions from Re React, again, there are going to be more similar things there. So cool, man. Good discussion. I'm excited as a React developer, for sure. I'm excited to see where this all goes. Uh, cool. Why don't we wrap it there? Um, anything to talk about on Build UI? I guess we had some YouTube videos go out. We are working on, we're going to wrap up the Tailwind course here pretty soon. So that's exciting. Um, I'm going to be going to the Tailwind Connect, which is like the first in-person Tailwind event. Um, that's going to be like in three weeks. So I'm excited about that. Give a little talk there. And um, we've got your React Server Components course and the Remix course to wrap up. And then um, it'll be fun to see what we do next. So yeah, yeah. I think, I think the best way to stay up to date is sign up for the newsletter. We'll yep. have a link and you know, all the, everything we send in the newsletter is always free to watch. So yep. you're not going to get hit with a paywall or anything. Yep. Cool. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. And I will catch you next week. See ya. Bye.